I'm going to ask uh, Sadat to come forward and to present his first rebuttal of 12 minutes. Uh, Sadat, please help me in welcoming him. A uh, number of issues were brought up. I won't be able to address all of them. I'll, address, I'll try to address as many as I can. Uh, first of all, there's a misunderstanding that there's chronic verses that are talking about concealment, hiding, or misinterpreting, or verbally uh, changing the Torah by the Jews. Uh, and uh, Alex is using that to say that there was no textual corruption of the Jews. But the two are not mutually exclusive. Both of those things could be done. So I'm not negating or denying uh, the meaning of those verses that Alex quoted from. Uh, both of those things could have happened. There could have been a textual corruption and there can be a corruption in the verbal interpretation of the book. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, the clearest verse uh, and the only verse actually that I brought up was Quran uh, chapter 2 verse 79. They write the scripture with their own hands. The preceding verses are talking about the Jews. They write the scripture with their own hands and then they attribute it to God. That doesn't sound to me like just concealment or like a misinterpretation. That sounds like textual corruption that is going on. That can't be denied. Um, Alex said if you look at the preceding verse, which is verse uh, 78, it says that amongst the Jews are some illiterate people who don't know the book. But, and, and he's implying that in 279, it's those illiterate people who are writing the book with their own hands and saying that it's from God. This obviously doesn't make sense because illiterate people don't write books, right? So that is talking about one issue of people, who, Jews who don't know the book, who misinterpret the book. And then verse 70, uh, 279 is talking about a different issue, which is about textual corruption of the book. Again, this is not some high-flying conspiracy theory. This is modern-day scholarship. Uh, Alex showed you a pamphlet of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, I've got about eight, nine books here on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I didn't pick out the books that I wanted or that I needed. I just looked them up in the Toronto Library catalog and I caught whatever I could. All of them are confirming the same thing. They're not confirming what Alex is saying. They're confirming that there was a fluid textual tradition, there were different versions of the Torah, and that we don't know what that Ewer text or that original Torah was. Uh, there are manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are confirming the Septuagint Torah. There are manuscripts there that are confirming the Samaritan Torah, which researchers are starting to take more seriously now. And there are uh, some manuscripts which definitely they label as proto-Masoretic. Now I'm guessing Alex is uh, with the Masoretic Torah, but he should tell us in the rebuttals, I would like to know, is he, telling, is he asking me to affirm the Masoretic Torah, or the Peshitta, or the uh, Samaritan, or the Septuagint? Which one is he affirming? And which one did Prophet Muhammad affirm? Which one did his disciples affirm? If Prophet Muhammad was affirming the Torah wholesale, which Torah wholesale was it? Was it the Samaritan Torah? Or was it the uh, uh, Septuagint or the Masoretic? Did he believe Lamech lived till 653 days or 777 days? Which one did he affirm? Right here in uh, the, the story of the scrolls by Giza Vermes, uh, who himself is a Jew, uh, he writes, he talks about textual elasticity in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He says the Qumran scribes arrogated to themselves the right to creative freedom and considered it their duty to improve the work that they were propagating. So as they were propagating the Word of God, they were also improving the Word of God. Do you see the convergence between this and the Qur'an? They wrote the book with their own hands and then they attributed it to God. Uh, Alex brought one of the favorite verses that I've seen uh, missionaries bring up, which is uh, to, uh, the Quran says in uh, chapter 10, verse 94, uh, to ask uh, those people who are reading the scripture uh, before you. Uh, so it's not saying, Alex, it's not saying go to that reformed Jewish synagogue or go to that Orthodox Jewish synagogue and ask them what version of the Torah they have. It's not saying that. It's saying ask those people who are reading the scripture before you. That means I can go to the Samaritans. I can go to the Greek Orthodox Christians, I can go to the Catholics. It doesn't say I have to go to the Pentecostals or to the Evangelical Christians. And each one of these groups has a different answer as to what constitutes the Torah. Also in Tafsir al Jalalain uh, by Asuyubi, he says that this verse also includes those people who became Muslim. In other words, those Jews and Christians who were reading the Jewish uh, and Christian scriptures and who became Muslim like uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a Jewish rabbi who converted to Islam. 
Now again, uh, Alex did what I expected him to do. He, he talked about how the Torah could not have been changed after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. He is omitting, I hope you see that, he's omitting the first 1,000 years of the history uh, of the Torah. That's not a small period. Uh, none of the manuscripts that he mentioned, none of the Dead Sea Scroll manuscript fragments fall into that 1,000 year window uh, from between, let's say, 1300 BCE, the time of Moses, and 300 BCE. And now, uh, so, <clears throat> Abraham ibn Ezra, this is a Jewish scholar, he talks about Deuteronomy 2.12, he also talks about these anachronisms. He, he says that uh, Deuteronomy 2.12, where it says the Horim, or the Horites, used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau drove them out. They destroyed the Horites from before them and settled in their place just as Israel did in the land that the Lord gave them. But at the time of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 2, God had not given the land to the Jews yet. He had not given uh, them the promised land. So how can it be talking about what the Jews did when they conquered the land? So even Jewish rabbis are part of that global Torah change conspiracy, I suppose, because they too are realizing that there's things that simply don't fit in properly in the text of the Torah. Um, Alex brought up a couple of uh, hadiths. One was from Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, in which the Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad, that is, um, sits uh, in front of the Torah and he says, I believed in thee and him uh, who revealed thee. These are open to interpretation because uh, what exactly did he believe in? Did he believe that uh, the physical hardcover, if there was one, it was probably a scroll, but if there was a physical hardcover, did that hardcover fall down from heaven? Did that come from heaven? Or was it the ink on the scrolls that came down from heaven? What is he affirming that is from God? In the context of that hadith, I believe it's clear that he is uh, affirming that there are commandments uh, in the Torah, even today, which I affirmed in my introduction, that even the present day Torah contains the words of God. He's saying, I believe in the meaning that commandment of the stoning of the adulterers, which is found in uh, Deuteronomy, by the way. Moreover, the hadith, as you pointed out, is not considered sahih or authentic. It's considered as a uh, hasan. And the reason for that is because there's a problematic person in the chain of narrators, and that's Hisham uh, ibn Sa'd. Uh, uh, Alex mentioned, I'm not sure because the discussion is not the Qur'an, but he mentioned the Hafs, the Hafs reading of the Qur'an and the Warsh reading of the Qur'an. Uh, and he said he's happy to accept Muslim tradition uh, in as far as we believe that the Qur'an today can be traced back to the Prophet Muhammad. He should then also accept the Muslim tradition which has it that the Qur'an was revealed in different variants. So we believe that the Hafs reading of the Qur'an came from God. We believe that the Warsh reading, from, uh, the Warsh reading of the Qur'an came from God. Um, if you find that difficult to understand, then think about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Then the different version of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. And then a different version of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34. Why are there three different versions? Modern day scholars say that this is because different writers wrote the Ten Commandments in different ways. And they did write them differently. They didn't make 15 commandments, but they did change them and they even changed the order of the commandments. I didn't bring up those three variations in the Ten Commandments because I want it to be consistent. I didn't want to say that three variants of the Ten Commandments can't be revealed by God. Because I know that the Qur'an has the Hafs and the Warsh recensions, both of which are revealed by God. I rather brought up the examples which cannot be reconciled, which are from different versions of the Torah. Septuagint, Samaritan, Peshitta, they're saying different things. Alex said quite correctly that these variants in the Hafs and the Warsh do not have any meaningful differences or they don't result in any uh, significant differences. But can he say the same about the differences in the different versions of the Torah? When Deuteronomy, uh, according to uh, the Masoretic text, says that God uh, commanded the Israelites to build an altar of worship on Mount Ebel, but then the Samaritan version is saying uh, that God commanded, in the same uh, passage in Deuteronomy, God commanded uh, the Israelites to build an altar of worship on Mount Gerizim. So which one is it? In this case, no Christian or no Jew believes that God revealed both of these commandments because they're in contradiction to one another. And if the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important to Alex, then he should go with the Samaritan reading. Because the oldest fragment that we have um, of that passage of Deuteronomy has Mount Gerizim. It's affirmed the Samaritan reading. So if uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are important to Alex, he should give up his Masoretic Torah and he should adopt the Samaritan Torah.
I think a bigger question than whether the Qur'an uh, affirms the Torah wholesale, that is, it does affirm the Torah, we're not denying that, but does it affirm it wholesale? A bigger question, and a more pertinent question for Christians should be, does Jesus actually affirm the Torah wholesale? Does the Old Testament actually affirm uh, the Torah wholesale? Um, for example, in Genesis 50.13 it says that Jacob was buried in Hebron. But in Acts 7.16, so we're talking not Old Testament but New Testament, it says Jacob was buried in Shechem. So is Paul affirming or is he denying uh, Genesis 50.13? How about Deuteronomy 12.31 where it says God uh, abhors a human sacrifice. God abhors or hates human sacrifice. But then in, in Judges chapter 11 verses uh, 29 to 39, God accepts or he presumably accepts the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter. You might remember that incident where he takes a vow and he says that he's going to burn his, well, not that he'll burn his daughter alive, but whoever walks in through the door and she happens to be that unfortunate person. So nowhere in the text, nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the Old Testament is Jephthah uh, taken to account for that. Is he criticized for that? Is he corrected for that? So is even the Old Testament, is even that affirming the Torah or not? Now it's true that Jesus, uh, he gave an example in the New Testament of Jesus affirming the Torah, making reference to the law and the prophets. That raises another question of why didn't he refer to the law uh, and the writings and the prophet, which make up that Tanakh that you have over there. So there's something fishy going on over there as well. But um, the fact that Jesus affirmed parts of Torah is not a problem because I as a Muslim uh, affirm parts of the Torah and I accept that Prophet Muhammad affirmed parts of the Torah. The question is, did Jesus and Muhammad affirm the Torah wholesale? Or did they know something that today's Christians don't know? In Matthew 5.38, Jesus says, You have heard it said, Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. That sort of, to me, sounds like a criticism of the old Torah law. Which according to Christians, Jesus himself had revealed in Deuteronomy 19.21. Where it says, Eye for an eye, and then it says, Your eyes shall not pity him. So how do you reconcile, Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and your eyes shall not pity him, Versus, you heard it said eye for an eye, but you should pity him, turn the other cheek. So, this too has been interpreted by scholars as Jesus critiquing uh, the Torah, but in a subtle way. Because Jesus is not picking a fight uh, uh, with the Torah text of his day. Prophet Muhammad and the Quran are not picking a fight with the text of the Torah day. But, when push comes to shove, we affirm the Torah in the same way that most liberal Christians today are affirming it. If you step out of this church, and you ask any Roman Catholic Christian on the street, you ask most Greek Orthodox Christians on the street, you ask liberal Ang Anglicans on the street. In our own country here in Canada, the United Church of Canada, if you were to ask members of the United Church, all of them will affirm and say they believe in the Bible. But when push comes to shove, they're not ready to affirm each and every point in the Bible, including in the Torah, because they realize that there are some mistakes which are there. Time? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. At this time, I will call. Alex, to uh, come and give his 12 minute rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have a problem. Actually, as a matter of fact, I had a problem since I started uh, preparing myself for the debate. I'm running out of time all the time. And as you saw, I, I didn't finish my first presentation, and I still have several slides more on. And uh, you know what? I'd like to ask who said that and my Muslim friends. If you allow me for a few more minutes to finish my presentation, then start 12 minutes of rebuttal. If you say yes, I'll go. If you say no, that's fine. So if you... That would be between you and Sadat. Uh, if I could get that extra time as well. I'm sorry? If I could get that extra time Yeah, so whatever time, time, whatever time you use up, Alex, I'll yes. have to credit Sadat. But Even also more. Bear, yeah, but also bear in mind people as well. Uh, we don't want to keep the people here uh, too long either. So, please do bear that in mind. Are you okay, guys? <laughs> You're okay? Thank you very much. One second.
may devote some time. Like how many hundreds of years do we need to really to change those Bibles to make it to, to remove supposedly Muhammad peace be upon him the time, uh, information about him from all the Genesis 1:1. And I explain to you that we have, it must be major, massive, global Torah change conspiracy among Jews and Christians, not among Muslims. And even, that will be even bigger than even the recent one, the recycling Jewish conspiracy. Okay. Well, now the second question I, I pose and I want to ask them, when do you think this conspiracy finally stopped? Then the Christian Jews said, well, it's enough. We have 1001 versions and we stop it. And let's adopt one version more or less to everybody. And of course, at least in the, in the name of Muhammad, which is supposed to be before the Muhammad is before him, and after him, it, it means the time when they stop finally doing any changes, it's only after Muhammad is before him. Then we go to the textual aspect of that. Okay? We have Christian Bibles, the Coptic Bible, Latin, Syriac, Armenian, Byzantine texts, and others. We have manuscripts as old as for the first or the fifth century, which means about 100 to 200 years before Muhammad was back when he was alive on this earth. And also we have Jewish Septuagint, I mean Jewish scripture, which is Septuagint, second century BC, before Christ. This is called second century BC. And yet we have this information of the Genesis of Dead Sea Scrolls and the genesis of today's Bible, or the Torah, are extremely similar. And yet we don't have what uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that to the Jews of Heba, saying, you will find that in your scripture, and we read the quotation. And also, let's go back to the story of creation, of course, in all this genesis from Dead Sea Scrolls up today, Genesis 1.1 and 1.2, they are like we see it now, identical, almost virtually the same. Therefore, I have, when I read this from Islamic sources and from website today, Muslim source, Muslim website today, when they're speaking about authentic narration, the first line of the Torah and second line of the Torah speaking about Muhammad, peace be upon him, rather than creation of the universe, now it's my time to say, well, I don't believe that. Okay. Now my time starts. Okay, so um, Sadat will have, I got here, two minutes and 54 seconds, so. Three minutes. So I'll give you three, we'll round it off. In Canada, we don't count the pennies, so we'll round it off to three, so you'll have in your next rebuttal period, you'll have eight minutes. That's Thank you. Enough. Fair enough? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, now, can we talk to the story? Now, I show you three verses from the Quran, then the Quran supposedly confirmed the Torah in the Jewish possession of 7th century AD. But there are more to that, there are about 14 of them, and you can see them on the screen. And let me remind you one. O children of Israel, believe in that I have sent down this Quran, confirming that which is with you. Now, we could, we could look at it as, let's say, the Quran as a book or revelation confirm the Torah as a revelation in a whole. Or the guy also that would say, well, I disagree with that. So the some parts of the Quran confirms some parts of the Torah. And he has a point, because the text of the Quran, it is not, it's very broad. It's not saying specifically what's confirmed. But, so we have to find the verse which is very specific. And yes, we do have one. And it's in Surah 1211. And it's found in the story of Joseph. It's only complete biblical story in the Quran you can find. So let's read uh, verse 3 from the story. We reveal unto you, Muhammad, peace be upon him, the best of stories through our revelations unto you of this Quran. Let's read the last verse. Indeed, in their stories, Joseph, Jacob, brothers, and other prophets, even people who were present at that time, there is a lesson for men of understanding. It, 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 the Quran is not a forged statement, but a confirmation of all existing books which were before it, the Torah, the Jail, and other scriptures of Allah. 
and a detailed explanation of everything and guide and mercy for people who believe. Well, we don't have time to go from all the prophets, as it's claimed here, to be correct. So we, we have to we can look only on the story of Joseph, and we can look only you have time only to look at the small fragment of the story of Joseph. So let's see. This fragment of the story of Joseph is based of stories, is not a forged statement, is a confirmation of the Torah, is a detailed explanation of everything, and a guide and a mercy of people who believe. So we'll, we'll focus on this one and the confirmation of the Torah. So Joseph was sold by his brothers to Egypt and now let's read what happened after. Let's read the Quran. And they, brothers, came to their father Jacob at nightfall weeping. They said, Oh father, we went racing with one another and left Yusuf by our belongings. That who will devour him, but you will not believe us, for it will never believe us, even when we speak the truth. And they brought his shirt stained with a false blood. He said, Nay, but your own selves have made up a tale. So for me, patience is most fitting, and is Allah alone whose help could be sought against that lie which you described. Let's go to the Torah. And they took a Joseph coat and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, These have we found. No, now they let it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his cloth and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Let's bring these two stories together. According to the Quran, brothers told their father that Joseph was dead and his father accused the brothers of lying. The brothers were crying about Joseph the Mist, not their father. According to the Torah, it's all the way around. It's all opposite. The brothers didn't tell their father that Joseph was killed. Jacob concluded on his own accord that Joseph was dead. Joseph's father had cried over his death. The brothers did not cry and were unsuccessfully trying to comfort him. And but the story didn't end here. <coughs> Let's go to the Quran when Joseph revealed himself in Egypt. And he said, Go with this short of mine and cast it over the face of my father. He will become clear sighted and bring me all your family. And then the caravan departed. Their father said, I do indeed feel the smell of Yusuf. If only you think me not a daughter. They say, by Allah, certainly you are in your old error. Then, when the bearer of glad tidings arrived, he cast it over the face of his father and became clear-sighted. He said, did I not say to you, I know from Allah, which you don't know? Let's go to the Torah. And they went out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan, and to the, uh, of Canaan, unto the Jacob of their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is a governor over all the land of Egypt. And what? And Jacob's heart fainted, for what? He believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, uh, which he has said unto them, and they, they see, saw the wagons which Joseph has sent to carry him. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived, and Israel said, actually, he probably cried out, It's enough! Joseph, my son, is yet alive, I'll go to see him before I die. Well, we have a big problem here. Well, I have to sh tell you first. All King James Bible, New King James Bible, NIV, ESV, even the Message Bible are agreeing, in agreeing, agreeing with this story. Every story. Well, the Coptic Bible, Latin Vulgate, Syriac Peshit, Armenian Bible, Byzantine text, agree. And you know why? Because the source agree. They came from Hebrew source. No variation of the text is fine, but the story and narration never changed. So now we have a problem here. If the story of the Joseph in the Quran is the best of stories, is it not a forged statement? Is it confirmation of the Torah? The explanation of everything and the guide? Well, as you see now, I show you one reason why Muslims today will deny or reject the Torah, it, especially in the Dead Sea Scrolls variant, because it's simply 
threatens the integrity of the Quran, but not only that, it will threaten the integrity of the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay? And the most rock solid doctrine of Islam. The question Was Muhammad an Arab's Quraysh tribe descendant of Ishmael? Well, let's see, let's read the source. Hadith, Sahih Bukhari, it said, She Hagar lived in that way in Mecca area till some people from the tribe of Jurum or family of Jurum passed by her and the child. The child Ishmael grew up and learned Arabic from them, and his virtue caused them to love and admire him as he grew up, and then he reached the age of puberty. They made him marry a woman from amongst them. Okay, that's very interesting. Let's go to the Torah. And we see, and God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. His mo- and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So my Muslim friends sometimes said, well, it's a mistake, it's not Paran, it should be Paran. Well, maybe. We'll address that issue later. But first of all, look at this passage. His mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Let's bring these two passages together in comparison. And according to the uh, Hadith, the 12th son of Ishmael is supposed to be 25% Chaldean by blood through the Abraham, 25% by blood through the Hagar, uh, Egyptian by blood through the Hagar, and 50% Arab by blood through the wife of Ishmael. According to the Torah, they are 25% by blood uh, Chaldean, 75% uh, Egyptian to the Hagar and the wife, and nothing Arabs. So immediate descent of Ishmael had nothing to do with Arab. But if the Ishmael lived in Mecca, in the Paran, in the Paran, I should say, well, does it matter? Sure, maybe. Let's, let's just read. Let's go back to the story of Joseph again. But let's read one verse when Joseph was thrown in the pit. And they sat down and to eat the bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, the company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and were going to carry it down to Egypt. Well, let's see the map. Father sent Joseph to go from she- Hebron to Shechem to check the welfare of the brothers, not to guard their belongings as they are running playing games as the small children. They, are, they were doing <coughs> serious business there. But he didn't find them there. He went up to the north of the Dothan and he was thrown in the pit. Now what happened is, from, you see the map, right side, the Gilead, the Ishmaelites who coming from Gilead purchased Joseph by accident and went down to Egypt. If the story of the Hadith is true, then Ishmaelites are supposed to be living in Mecca. And let's say if they travel to Egypt, they have to go up here to Gulf of Aqaba and ask where should they turn left or right to Egypt? Well, yes, of course it's left, right? But in order for them to come from Mecca and purchase Joseph by accident, without receiving any emails or SMS from brother of Joseph, they have to turn right, purchase Joseph, and say, well, where are we going? Lebanon, no, no, Egypt. And turn it and go down. Well, it does make sense, this detour. Okay, then what I have to conclude is Joseph was thrown on the pit in that part of Canaan, and then Ishmaelites must be living in Jordan area, not in, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Therefore, I have to say again that today's story, the problem, the main problem I believe, that my personal belief, that Muslims will deny the Torah as well as that, will reject it and find anything to reject it. The main one is because the Torah not only threatened the integrity of the Quran, it's also threatened, threatened the integrity of whatever Muhammad peace be upon him said and threatened the integrity of most solid, uh, seems most solid statement of doctrines of Islam. Thank you, Amda. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, Sadat, you will have next three minutes. So for your rebuttal, second rebuttal, uh, you have eight minutes. Uh, the statement that I found most amusing was that the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, undermines the, uh, the, the authenticity of the Quran. That was for me the most interesting thing because it wasn't the Quran, it wasn't variant manuscripts of the Quran that they dug up 
in, that, in those caves in Qumran. It was manuscripts of the Torah. Uh, Dr. Sidney White Crawford, who was a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, says in an article called The Fluid Bible, that tells you all, there, all you need to know, The Fluid Bible, the blurry line between biblical and non-biblical texts. She says, the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal a surprising fact. Even in the case of the Torah, there was no fixed text, either of the Torah as a whole or of any of the individual books. Amongst the scroll is a whole group of texts that are related to but different from the present day books of the can canonical uh, Torah. Some of the texts are simply copies of biblical books with variants, the results of centuries of hand copying. Then she puts in brackets, scribal error or manipulation and textual growth. Some of these texts differ marked, markedly, at times starting from the standard authoritative Jewish version of the Bible, known as the Masoretic text. Nor do they resemble the two other major biblical textual traditions, the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch. So you tell me what the Dead Sea Scrolls are saying. Are they saying it's bringing the authenticity of the Quran into the question, or is it bringing the authenticity of the Torah into question? I'm still waiting on an answer on which Torah, which version of the Torah God, um, Alex wants me to affirm. Uh, like, is it the Masoretic text that you follow? Okay. Okay, since Alex wants me to affirm the Masoretic text, according to him, Prophet Muhammad affirmed the Masoretic text, even though the Masoretic text didn't come into existence until two to four centuries after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. It's only then that the vowel markings and the accents and everything were put in. But if he wants me to affirm the Masoretic Torah, then prove to me first that the New Testament affirms the Masoretic Torah. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 6, it quotes from the Torah, it says, and that all the angels of God worship him. This you find in Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 43, but only in the Septuagint version. You don't find it in Alex's version. You won't find it in that Masoretic version, which is translated by Jews. So what happened to that verse? Is it not lost? You would have to then accept that a verse from Deuteronomy, part of the Torah, has been lost. Uh, you know, uh, Paul was quoting it in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, but we don't have it anymore. So now he is engaging in a Torah change conspiracy after the time of Jesus and after the time of Paul. Similarly, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, quotes from Psalm chapter 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. That's how Paul quotes it. But when you go back to Psalm 46, I challenge Alex to come up and show me from his Torah. Show me where it says that, that um, a body you have prepared for me. Yes, you'll find that in the Septuagint Torah, but you won't find that in the Masoretic Torah. What about Matthew 12, 21? where he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 4. Matthew ends by quoting, And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. But this is not found in Isaiah 42 in the Masoretic version. So only until Alex can show us that, he should show us these verses uh, from the Masoretic Torah, then we too can affirm the Masoretic Torah. Otherwise, it seems that uh, Jesus' disciples or apostles might have been quoting from the Septuagint. Also, if the Masoretic is correct, then why does your King James Version quote from the Septuagint in Psalm 22, 16, when it says, they pierced my hands and my feet? Here, the, the King James Version translators conveniently jump over to the Septuagint in order to prove a theological point. It, it doesn't say that in the Masoretic text. Uh, Alex says that it's unthinkable, and he made fun of that. It's unthinkable that Jews could come together and they could all agree uh, to uh, change the Torah after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. They don't have to agree. Who said they agreed? That's why you have different versions of the Torah, because obviously they did not agree. The, you know, Greek Orthodox Christians couldn't be convinced by the uh, Masoretes who wrote the Masoretic text. They weren't convinced by that. Till this day, they don't accept that. Uh, the other thing is that every modern uh, translation of the Bible is essentially an eclectic translation. If you read any modern critical uh, version of the Bible, it's an eclectic tradition, which means it combines from the different versions. Sometimes they will go with a manuscript of the Masoretic Torah, sometimes they will go with a manuscript of the Septuagint Torah, they'll say, this is the superior reading here. Or they'll take it from the Samaritan, they'll say, we have these reasons to believe that this is the superior reading here. Guess what they're doing? They're creating a new Torah. They're creating a new Torah when they do that, because by making an eclectic version of the Bible, by borrowing from the different manuscripts, what they're essentially doing is they're creating a Torah which never existed before. So that process is happening right now as we speak. Moreover, I also showed that the uh, verbal, uh, verbal corruption or verbal twisting of the Torah 
that is not inconsistent with the idea of textual uh, changing and textual corruption of the Torah. So let me give you an example. The example I've given earlier on, Ishmael, will he be a wild man or will he be a fruitful man? Now you might say that doesn't make much of a theological difference, it's not theologically significant, but, but clearly it is. Because Christian missionaries like to tell us that Prophet Muhammad is from the line of Ishmael, and Ishmael is uh, you know, a wild, uh, a wild ass, a, a wild donkey, a, something like this, wild man, an ass, a donkey, or something like that. How they got that, I'm not sure, because all the Hebrew word says is pere, which means wild. The Samaritan version says para, which is fruitful. Now you can imagine a prophet coming from the descendants of a man, Ishmael, who God says is going to be a fruitful man, not a wild man, a fruitful man. So which version is it? Which one did Prophet Muhammad read? When he was reading Deuteronomy, did he read, uh, in Arabic, did he read that Ishmael is going to be a wild man, or did he read that Ishmael is going to be a fruitful man? Which version did he read? And again, the main point that I want to emphasize is that repeatedly, repeatedly, Alex only covered the time after Jesus or after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. He did not cover the first 1,000 years, which are dark years. We know nothing. I mean, just prove to me that the Torah existed 900 BCE. Prove to me that the Torah even existed as it does in its present day form in 800 BCE or in 700 BCE or in 600 BCE. We can't do that because those years are dark years. We know nothing. How do you account for the fact that during the, time, during the time of King Josiah, as I said, they were not even aware of the basic commandment that you shouldn't worship idols. You shouldn't build altars and kill your kids, sacrifice your children on them. How did that happen? That's Judaism for dummies. That's Judaism 101. Everyone knows that in Judaism, you don't worship statues and idols and you don't put them in the temple. Why were they so unaware of this during the time of Josiah? If the Torah had never been lost, the Torah had never been forgotten, the Torah had never been corrupted, the Torah had never been changed. Similarly, during the time of Ezra, as I pointed out, I'm waiting for him to address that in the rebuttals. They didn't know that you're supposed to live in booths during the time of the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. But that's in the book of Leviticus. Didn't they ever read the book of Leviticus? So we have proven transmission breaks uh, even before the time of the Prophet Muhammad and even before uh, the time of Jesus. This is probably what led Jeremiah to say in, uh, Jer in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 8. Uh, Jeremiah says, how can we say that we, are lie, uh, that we are wise and that the Torah of God is with us? For the scribes have falsified it with their pens. I'm paraphrasing, but that's in Jeremiah 8.8. 8. Um, he's not talking about here uh, verbal uh, corruption because he's saying they falsified it with their pens. Okay, this is now the second. Yes, please go ahead. This will be the uh, second uh, rebuttal, and it's uh, five minutes out. Yes. Am I connected? Connected? Oh yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's go for. I want to give you one evidence that proves that, that Jews never changed the Torah. Well, again, I have to use the same article of Basam Zawadi, and I will show you a few statements of companions of Muhammad, peace be upon him, therefore, wrought severe punishment, and it is said this means a valley in hell be unto those who write the scriptures with their, own, with their hands. Change the description and traits of Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Torah, Ibn Abbas, commentary on Surah 279. Tafsir ibn Kathir says, Because they, the Jews, distorted the Torah, they added to it what they liked, and they erased from it what they hated, and they erased the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the scripture, from the Torah, and for that Allah became angry. Again, the view of Ibn Uthman Afar. But again, commentary on Surah 279. Early Quranic commentator said, The leaders of the Jews in Medina erased the description of traits of Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the Torah, and they wrote other traits of description. Okay, let's go to now Tanakh, Old Testament. And I have to bring again this scroll, it's my favorite subject. And now, but now it goes to Isaiah, great Isaiah scroll. I want to read from uh, verse 53, uh, chapter 53. Surely our disease did he bear, and our uh, pains he carried, therefore, 
thereas we did it steam him slick and smitten of God and afflicted. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet did he, open, he, not, uh, he not open his mouth like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter as a sheep that before it shares he is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment was, uh, he was taken away, and this is judgment generation who did reason. For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Of the travail of his soul he shall see it to the full, even my servant, who is by his knowledge, did justify the righteous one to the many, and the iniquities did he bear. Therefore will I give him, uh, divide him in a portion among the great, and he shall divide as poor with the mighty, because he beareth his soul unto the dead, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And I assure you, my Muslim friends, and you know it very well, because the Christians are using these passages of Isaiah 53 for two, over almost 2,000 years to prove Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And they start with Philip and Enoch. Okay, and we can read from Acts, and it's recorded in the New Testament. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south, unto the way of goes down to Jerusalem, to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, the man of Ethiopia, has come to Jerusalem for the worship. He was returning, was returning and sitting in his chariot to read Isaiah the prophet. The place of the scripture when he was read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a uh, lamb down before his share, so opened he not his mouth. In his, sorry, in his humiliation, his judgment uh, was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life was taken from the earth. And the inner answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto the certain water, and the Enoch said, See, there is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mightest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Well, I have to say, if Jews were so wicked, they changed God's word in the connection with Muhammad, peace be upon him. Why did the strongest passage about the crucifixion of Jesus, which speaks against the Quran, as a matter of fact, and the Jews that don't like it as well, survive from the Dead Sea Scrolls until today? If we follow Muslim logic, the passage should have been removed first before any passage about Muhammad, but it wasn't. Okay? Therefore, I have to say that allegation towards the Jews of changing the Torah are illogical, make no sense, and contradict the fact. So, my conclusion is archaeological discoveries of the last century confirm the Torah was, have never been changed during the last 2,139 years. We have two seconds to go, but that, that's okay. Okay, now we enter the phase of the debate tonight where we deal with the conclusions, and each speaker will have 12 minutes. Uh, again, a reminder for questions uh, and answers. Uh, please uh, indicate who you want to ask the question to, to Sadat or to Alex. And then during the q and I'm going to select five, randomly select five questions for each of the speakers. And the question to whom the speaker is given, you'll have two minutes, and the other party will have one minute to respond. So we're entering the conclusion. I'm going to ask Sadat again to come up and present us with his 12 minute concluding statements. They, the Jews, wrote the scripture or the book with their own hands and then they attributed it to God. This would have sounded like a conspiracy theory to most Jews and Christians back in the 7th century of the Common Era. Today, however, we see this Quranic verse with its historical insight vindicated by the Dead Sea Scrolls and other manuscript discoveries. 
Today, in various ways, biblical scholars of the Pentateuch are affirming that people wrote it with their own hands. And then they attributed it to Moses and thus to God. Keep in mind that we've only briefly examined only five books uh, of the Bible. Uh, there's a total of 66 books, uh, or 73 if you follow the Catholic canon of the Bible. So the point being that we've already run into the red, we've already run into trouble with just five out of the 66 books. I began by making brief mention of the documentary uh, hypothesis, the most dominant hypothesis in academia today regarding the composition of the Torah. And we saw that this hypothesis holds that there were at least four different strands of the Torah. Uh, just like we have the Gospels, Gospel according to Mark and Gospel according to Luke, etc. Similarly, we have four different versions or subversions of the Torah within any given one version of the Torah. We have the Torah according to the J source, the Torah according to the E source, the Torah according to the D source, and the Torah according to the P source. And they often have different views. Uh, Alex in his rebuttals, I was hoping that he was going to address some of those points, like Genesis 1. Was animals created first, or Genesis 2 was a, were the human beings created first? That's two different versions of the creation account in Genesis. Without having gone into the details of this specific hypothesis, that is the documentary hypothesis, I still presented other general and specific points that would indicate that today's Pentateuch or Torah is not the same Holy Torah as the one that was revealed to the Prophet Moses. Uh, and that the Torah must have been changed and corrupted long before the time of Muhammad and even before the time of Jesus, and Alex didn't address that. Um, in fact, I said in my introduction that he would probably spend most of his time on trying to prove that the Torah had not been changed after Muhammad, but I was wrong. He spent his entire presentation trying to show that the Torah was not changed after the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And by, by tackling that straw man, he uh, denied the scope and the variety of Muslim views and opinions on where, when, and how the Torah was changed. Some of the names of notable Muslim scholars who said that the Torah had been changed before the time of Muhammad include Ibn Hazm and Ibn Taymiyyah. Both of them spoke about this problem of broken transmission uh, by the time of Ezra. Ibn Kathir in al bidayah wa Nihaya comments on the translation of the Torah that he had read, and he said that no sane person can believe it. More importantly than this, Ibn Abbas, because uh, Alex quoted from Sahih Bukhari. In Sahih Bukhari, you have Ibn Abbas, the disciple and the companion of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and he also understood the Quran, chapter 2, verse 79, to mean that the Jews had undertaken textual tampering of their scriptures. Uh, he also, I earlier on already vindicated uh, Ibn Kathir, where he was quoting from Uthman ibn Affan, saying that the Jews took away what they didn't like and they added what they liked. How can you deny that? You have to. You have to affirm that the Samaritans added Mount Gerizim because they liked it. They took out Mount Abel because they didn't like it. Or if you take their side of the debate, then it is uh, the mainstream Jews who added uh, Mount Abel because they liked it, uh, and they took away Mount Gerizim because they didn't like it. Even though earlier on in Deuteronomy, uh, Mount Abel is the, uh, the mountain of the cursing, and Mount Gerizim is the mountain of the blessing. So we saw there's a remarkable convergence between what this verse of the Quran 279 that is says and what modern day scholarship of the Torah is saying. Richard Friedman, Dr. Richard Friedman and who wrote the Bible, page 28, he's a Harvard PhD and professor of Hebrew, he says there is hardly a biblical scholar in the world actively working on the problem who would claim that the five books of Moses were written by Moses or by any one man. Rabbi Yaakov Menken in the Everything Torah book. Uh, also, if you go to Torah.org, he's the director of that website. He, he admits the general concept of multiple authors quickly became the dominant view among Bible critics. Today, one can find schools of thought claiming that the Torah as we know it came into existence in Solomon's time or in Ezra's time. They all reject the idea uh, that the Torah came into existence at the hand of Moshe or Moses. Peace be upon him. So Alex is not just up against me or the straw man that he uh, constructed, rather he's up against an ocean of biblical scholars on this issue. He's also contending with Jeremiah, as we saw. Jeremiah said, how can you say we are wise and the Torah of the Lord is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. In the definition of Torah that Alex gave, he didn't provide the definition which the Jews have, which is that it can include books even beyond the five books of Moses. For them, any of the books in the Old Testament uh, are included in that. So if I were to affirm the entire Torah as the Jews see it, then I'm affirming Jeremiah 8.8, .8, and Jeremiah 8.8 .8 is undermining parts of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Alex did try to show that certain Quranic verses and Hadiths indicate that the Pentateuch is not corrupted. We saw upon closer examination, those verses and Hadiths are not saying what Alex thinks that they're saying. Uh, there's no way that verse 279 is talking about the Jews, and then verse 279 is talking about those same illiterate Jews writing the book with their own hands and saying it's from God. Logically, that doesn't make sense. Out of the many points that I raised, Alex did not... Uh, 
I was going to say he didn't respond satisfactorily, but actually he just ignored it completely. The problem of uh, the canonization, the different versions, the problem of the broken transmission of the Torah, the problem of anachronisms, the problems of contradictions, uh, none of these were uh, even addressed. Uh, and certainly not the moral corruption of the prophets, which is an issue for me as a Muslim. Um, for, and, th and I'm addressing sort of the Muslims in the audience really now, is that if we believe that the present day Torah is uncorrupted, then we're forced to believe that the prophets of God are corrupted. Uh, I mean, Lot committing incest with his daughters, you all know in your hearts, you, you wouldn't let that person be the pastor of your church. You wouldn't let that person be the pastor of your church. So if we wish to vindicate God and the prophets of these allegations of corruption and immorality, then we are forced to believe that it is the present day Torah which is at fault. The present day uh, Torah has some corruption or uh, flaws in it. We have to choose our side. On the one side are God and his prophets, and on the other side are the anonymous scrib uh, scribes and priests and redactors uh, who wrote and copied the Torah. As a Muslim, I say that the present day Pentateuch can be corrupt, but Abraham, Noah, Lot cannot be corrupt. The present day Torah can be corrupt, but Moses, peace be upon him, cannot be corrupt. The present day Torah can be corrupt, but Jesus cannot be corrupt. The scribes and the priests can be corrupt. They can be forgetful, they can be negligent in their duties of properly preserving and transmitting the Torah, but God Almighty cannot be negligent or forgetful of His commitments. He doesn't have to put a rainbow in the sky to you know, remind Himself of His commitment to not send another flood again. It doesn't make sense. And then He sends more floods anyhow. The biggest issue, however, that I have reiterated time and time again is that Alex um, banked his entire presentation on the idea that the Torah could not have been changed after the time of the Prophet Muhammad, even though it was, because the proponents of the Septuagint text will tell you that that's exactly what happened. Uh, Jews got together and they inserted vowel marks that God didn't give them. They inserted accents that God didn't give them. And as we saw in the case of Perek and Para, that can make a big theological difference as well. In, in essence, when Alex is saying that the Torah could not have been changed, what he really means is that his version of the Torah was not changed. That's really what he means. But by necessity, uh, he has to acknowledge that the Septuagint hasn't changed then, hasn't it? That 70 Jew, Jewish scholars that came together uh, around uh, 250 BC or before that, and that's what they did. They cooked up a false Torah. Uh, but for some reason, we see that Paul is quoting in Acts, he's quoting from that uh, cooked up uh, Septuagint Torah, which uh, Alex considers to be incorrect. Uh, it doesn't make sense. The reason this 1,000 year window is a big problem is, uh, I give the example, if I had a teenage son or daughter, God forbid, who ran away from home for 10 years, uh, and then they come back after 10 years, uh, for me to just assume that there's still that same innocent uh, child uh, that they were 10 years ago, unchanged, uh, uncorrupted uh, by the world or by the society around them, that is wishful thinking. Um, it's even more wishful thinking if I know that son or that daughter was rebellious, disobedient, uh, and morally corrupt in the first place. And then they come back after 10 years with even more signs of moral corruption. So what is the example that the children of Israel had set for themselves in the first place, very early in the game? Moses had barely been away a few days on the mountain, and they had started worshipping that golden cow. That's a big bonus point for the Hindus, right? The Hindus win the debate. So within a few days, we see that the Israelites had changed and corrupted the very concept of God itself. The very concept of God, they lost that, they corrupted that. They lost and corrupted Tawheed, they lost and corrupted monotheism. If the Israelites could corrupt the very concept of God and throw God behind their backs, so to speak, how safe do you think the Torah was going to be in their hands? What's holier, God or the Torah? In fact, Moses predicted that they would act even more corruptly than, than this after his death. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 27, Moses says to them, For I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, while I am still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more then after my death? For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn away from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, for you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. They wrote the scripture with their own hands. Moreover, even if the Torah or whichever version, Masoretic version of the Torah is 100% trustworthy, what does that actually mean? What does it actually prove? Does it vindicate Christianity? Are you going to stop eating pork? Are you going to stop worshipping the Trinity? Uh, are you going to stop making fun of Muslims who marry more than one wife? Like, what will it actually change on a practical level? 
Um, the funny thing, the ironically, the ironic thing is that for a, a Trinitarian Christian actually has less reason to trust the Torah because the Torah is not affirming Trinitarianism, it's affirming monotheism, unqualified monotheism, belief in one God. So for theological reasons alone, as a Muslim, I have more reason to trust uh, the Torah than a Christian. And I reiterate again that I do. I do trust it with caveats and qualifications. Today's Torah is trustworthy in some limited way. In fact, I trust it in the same way that Roman Catholics and liberal Protestants and liberal and Reformed Jews trust it. Like them, I put some trust in the Torah, but cautiously and with a pinch of salt. The difference between them and us Muslims is probably only in how much is corrupted and what exactly is corrupted. For me, the present day Torah or Pentateuch is like this bridge. Some say that it's very damaged, some would say it's not that damaged. Uh, some would say the first part of the bridge is weaker, or the latter part of the bridge is weaker. But the inevitable conclusion must be that it is not a bridge you want to get stuck on. That is not a bridge you want to get stuck on. That's not a bridge you want to jump up and down on while yelling hallelujah. That would be an unwise and irresponsible thing to do. This is a bridge that you need to navigate very carefully and with great caution, and cross it as quickly as you can in order to reach stronger and more stable ground. As a Muslim, I identify and consider Islam and the Qur'an and the authenticated, authenticated teachings of Prophet Muhammad as that stronger and more stable ground, which is God-affirmed, not man-affirmed, and that is the destination that we need to progress to. I hope you will at least look across that bridge and examine or re-examine Islam and the Qur'an with an open heart. Thank you. Five seconds yet to go, but that's great. So, Alex, uh, you have 12 minutes for concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, as I'm connected, so I want to say, it seems to me like most modern Muslims have more information about the corruption of the Torah than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had and that Muhammad is upon him. Think of so, can we trust today's story? And I want to bring something from this book, and uh, surprisingly I saw this book on a Muslim table, so I asked every Christian to grab the copy of this book and examine it thoroughly. So, on this page 44 in this book, on the concept of sin, it said, Islam regards the concept of original sin and the need of atonement by God himself via dying on the cross as a pure invention of those who came after Jesus Christ, declaring themselves as Christians. And of course, I heard many Muslims attacking specifically Apostle Paul of creating Christianity. Well, let's go to the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And let us read from Job 15:14. What is man? Who he should be that he should be clean and he should be born or he which is born of woman uh, that should be righteous Isaiah 64 6 but with all as unclean things and all our righteousness are as a filthy rag and we all do fade as leaves and our iniquities like the wind has taken us away and Zabur Psalms 51 5 behold I was shaped in iniquity and it still did my mother conceive me. We have to go to the Torah further in, and we have to go to the beginning, what happened at the fall of man. And let us read the curse of God. And unto Adam he said, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of, of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till you thou return into the ground, and out of, uh, for out of it uh, was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So it's very interesting. God said, well, now you're going to work for peanuts, hard, and you will die. And it's exactly what we're doing right now, until the present days. But something happened before that and after this. So well, let's read. And the eyes of the uh, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. 
Well, the question is, where did it get the skin from? An animal. What do you have to do to an animal to take a skin off? You kill it, right? So it was a, somebody died because of somebody's disobedience. Let's, let's move on to the next chapter. And in the process of time, it came to pass, the king brought this, uh, of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first link of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord has respected unto Abel and to his offering, but to the king and his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why thou art wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and thou shalt be his desire, and, now to the, and, and thou shalt rule over him. But what happened next? And Cain talked with Abel and his brother, and came to pass, and they went to the field, and Cain arose up against Abel, the bro his brother, and slew him. Well, God basically said, well, you see the two different sacrifices, blood sacrifice by Abel and bloodless sacrifice by Cain, and both are sinners, according to Genesis 3. And God said, well, accept blood sacrifice, not bloodless sacrifice. You should know better Cain. And you know what Cain did? Or oh, you want blood, God? And he slew his brother, said, that's blood. And they're buried. Well, as we move on from Genesis 4 onward, Noah, Abraham, Job, everybody brought blood sacrifice. Like it, it's an amount of blood sacrifice mentioned in the, in the Torah and in the entire Old Testament. It's, it's a huge. And we'll, we'll mention, we, we can go on and on. But what I want to show you, I will focus and make a small detour into the Abraham sacrifice. And he, God, said, Take thou thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for the burnt offering upon the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And surprisingly, like I saw, like many Muslims said, Well, uh, we are the Abrahamic faith, we belong to the faith of Abraham, and we do what Abraham did, and meaning like the Abraham built the Kaaba and he worshipped the way modern Muslims are worshipping and etc. And of course they have a Qurban, which is sacrifice festival. And you can see Eid, uh, Eid al-Adha festival. Muslims around the world celebrate Ibrahim willingness to sacrifice his son to, uh, for Allah following the annual Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. And of course we have many different animals, thousands, thousands of animals being killed. The camels, cows, uh, sheep, goats, etc. But what I find astonishing is, first of all, and it seems to me like Muslims, what we do, we have one third of this sacrifice, whatever it is, they, they eat in the, within the family. One third is given to relatives or friends, distant relatives or friends. And one, one third is given to complete strangers. Okay, now that's fine, it's very generous. And it's nice and tasty for sure. But what is re really this kind of sacrifice remind me of this sacrifice? What the Christian does in the West. It's called uh, Thanksgiving Turkey. He thanks God for He provides for us and let us eat and be happy and be merry, right? But let's go to Abraham's sacrifice. So we have a very interesting story here. Let us focus on one, two words. And God said, offer him his son Isaac or Ishmael if you like, they are for the burnt offering upon the one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And after that, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up to the burnt offering instead of his son. Well, if you want to commemorate really a uh, sacrifice of Ishmael, I'm mean, sorry, the sacrifice of Abraham, supposedly do it with Ishmael or Isaac, doesn't matter. You should not eat the sacrifice, but you should burn it down. Plus, uh, let me bring the Torah in order to ask you all, is it okay to bring haram sacrifice to God, or it will be abomination? Will you, it's okay for Muslims to sacrifice the swine and eat from it? I don't think so. Let's go to the Torah and Leviticus. And it said, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and to the Aaron, saying to them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which the, you, thou shalt, you shall eat uh, all the beasts that are on the earth, among the all the beasts of the earth. 
whatsoever, whosoever, uh, whatsoever part in the hoof and is cloven footed and chewed the cut among the beasts, that shall the you eat. Nevertheless, those shall you not eat from them that chew the cut or from them that divide the hoof, as a camel, because he chewed the cut but divided not the hoof. He is unclean unto you, haram. And verse 7 we have, and swine. So it, he divide the hoof and be cloven footed, yet he should not the cut. He is unclean to you. Of their flesh thou shalt not eat, and their carcasses shall not you touch. They are unclean to you, haram. Therefore, you see, if the swine is haram, and also the uh, camel is haram, according to the, the Torah. Well, somebody, I just went to the internet and find all these pictures and we all know that the Muslims say, well, we love Jesus, Jesus is a prophet of Islam, Jesus is a Muslim. Uh, in the way of, uh, in the path of Abraham, we have three faiths, one God, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and we are all sons of Abraham. But yet it's very interesting, when I'm reading the Quran, is if I'm driving on the car, on one road and I see one landscape and I go to a certain destination but if I'm writing, uh, reading, sorry, uh, reading the, the Torah or the Old Testament I'm a complete different landscape and I'm going to a complete different destination and I was just puzzling, why so? why we have so many differences? as a matter of fact, we have almost nothing in common among us and I think the reason is because we have like Islam, uh, the Quran speak differently of the story of Adam in the Quran and the story of Adam and Torah, they are completely different. So if we debate in the beginning, as we progress, trying upon these two different roads, we have different Abraham, we have different Noah, we have different David, Solomon, and when we reach Christ, it's millions of miles apart. Nothing in connection. We have nothing. Please stop, stop. Uh, we have nothing in common, I have to say that. Let's go back to the prophets. Sacrifice. The all sacrifices from Genesis 3 goes to Isaiah 53, which I briefly mentioned. Now I'm going to read it to you. Seven, most of the verses. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities. His, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord has, has, shall prosper in his hand. By his, uh, he shall uh, he shall see his travail of the souls and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide she shall divide spoils with the strong, because he had poured out his soul into the death, and he was numbered with the transgressor and bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. See we have many verses speaking about what the Christians are using from Old Testament proving Christ is his perfect sacrifice for sin of all mankind so at this point I think we've collected uh, is there another question here? there's a question here the second here okay and we have two different boxes here. Which one's for Sadat and which one's for us? That's for Sadat. Okay, so Sadat, you've got the green box. And Alex, you have the blue box, the recycling box. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, when I, when I take the questions, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make sure, if you're asking questions that are not relevant to the topic, we, we can't take them, because the, the debate is on, can we trust today's Torah? So, questions that are unrelated to this topic, we, we really cannot address, because they're not pertinent to the debate. So, we want the questions that are relevant to tonight's topic. And because time is of the essence, we, we don't want to waste our time with the time of our speakers. So, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to ask uh, both Sadat and Alex to come up to the front and uh, stand here by the podium. And I'm going to select the questions and ask them. So if you can come up. So the way this is going to work, I'm going to select the question. And uh, the question to whom it's addressed, the, the person will have two minutes and then the other person can have uh, a minute. Okay? So I'm just going to randomly uh, pick a question here. And this, the blue box is for Alex. Uh, Alex, uh, many facts narrated in the Quran are confirmed in latest discoveries of Old Testaments. Uh, please comment. If you need me to repeat that, I can't. For Alex, many facts narrated in the Quran are confirmed in latest discoveries of Old Testament. Please comment. Uh, I don't understand what the latest discoveries of Old Testament means. Uh, and what is confirmed, basically, when you read every story of Adam, Eve, and all the prophets to the Quran and to the Jesus Christ, you find them completely in disagreement with the Quranical stories. I don't know what Quran is still confirm. It's basically, I could, I got, I will agree if the Quran said, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, well, I sent the Quran to deny or correct the Torah, not to confirm. Fourteen places it said, I sent the Quran to confirm the Torah. And I have no idea what is to confirm because nothing to confirm. Basically, the Quran denies the Torah at all. Okay. Um, would you like to respond to that? Uh, to that? Yeah, well, I'm just repeating myself that the Quran in chapter 2, verse 79, makes a general allegation without specifics of the, the Jews having tampered with the scriptures textually in written form. They wrote things and then they said it's from God. Um, do discoveries of uh, Old Testament manuscripts prove that? To some extent, in a general sense, yes, because Dead Sea Scroll scholars are saying that the uh, Torah was a very fluid text uh, at the time of. Uh, well, around 250 BCE, the time of the uh, Essene community there in the Qumran caves. Uh, they're confirming that, as I quoted earlier on, that scribes felt the freedom to add and to delete and to improve, quote-unquote, improve the text in whichever ways they felt. Uh, so in that sense, it is confirming. Uh, we had the examples of Mount Ebal or Mount Ger uh, Gerizim, which one is the original. These are all examples that the Torah was a fluid text, even during the time of Jesus, and things were still being changed. Thank you. Question for Sadat. Um, this is a very long question, and okay, this one is not really relevant, so I'm going to have to pass on this. It's not relevant. Okay, question for Sadat. Um, Hmm, seems like it's been corrupted, this, uh, this note here. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, okay, I, I, so that, look at that question. I don't know if that is a relevant question. Is that relevant to tonight's debate? You can take it if you want. If not, I can just pass, but I, I don't know if that's relevant. Did you want to take that? I'll, I'll, oh, I'll yeah, I do understand. Okay, let me read it out. Okay, okay, question for Sadat. How much of your arguments in percentage are non-Muslim skeptics' arguments? Okay, I think I understand the question. That What percentage of the arguments that I use today uh, were from uh, skeptics? Or did it say non-Christians or did it say non-Christians? It said uh, percentage of non-Muslim skeptic arguments. Yeah, non-Muslim skeptic arguments. Yeah, they basically all were. Because if I, uh, if I quoted Ibn Hazm uh, or Ibn Taymiyyah, that wouldn't mean much to you. So I quoted from Ibn Ezra. I quoted from uh, Richard Friedman. I quoted from people who are from the Judeo-Christian scholarly tradition. Um, but I think, I might be mistaken, but I think the implication of the question is 
uh, that these people are like atheists and agnostics and why are you quoting them? They have like an anti-religious or an anti-supernatural bias or something like that. Um, but um, the, the, uh, as I explained, today the Catholic Church, for example, does not take everything in the Old Testament. Literally, they believe that there are errors in the Old Testament. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to agree with the Catholic Church. But the point is, uh, they're not, they don't have an anti-religious bias. They don't have an anti-supernatural uh, bias or anything like that. Bart Ehrman is a good example of somebody who started out as an evangelical Christian. So when he was examining the Bible at that time, he wouldn't have had a skeptical view of the Bible. He was trying to view it from a faith perspective, but eventually he ran into problems that you know, he couldn't answer. And if I could just, one quote is from, uh, again, from Dr. Richard Friedman, in Who Wrote the Bible? He said, this investigation, meaning the textual investigation into the Bible, did not develop as a controversy of religion versus science or religious versus the secular. On the contrary, most of the investigators were trained in religious traditions and knew the Bible as well as those who accepted the traditional answers. Indeed, from the outset to the present day, a significant proportion of critical biblical scholars, perhaps the majority, have been at the same time members of the clergy. Thank you. Alex, would you like to respond? I, yes. Uh, as I said in the beginning of my first presentation, uh, I, from the most I expect a lot of information or a lot of um, arguments came, uh, supposed to come from the Quran, from the Hadith. But so far, what I see from the Quran and Hadith is either confirmation of the Torah in the parts in full, and if they said, well, it was corrupted, supposedly, then it was corrupted mainly, presumably, in the name of Muhammad, who was peace upon him, was removed from the Torah. And that's very interesting because as we can see, if you're going to read this website of Basam Zawari, you will see how many times the name of Muhammad supposedly being removed from the Torah was mentioned by early Islamic sources. So, I, I just wonder, like, you have to go with these guys and accept them and we can play around and see if it was indeed the name of Muhammad or his description was in the Torah, in any Torah that we have right now. Okay, thank you. Um, question for Alex. Uh, Alex, from a Christian perspective, when will the law, when will the law and the prophets be fulfilled or has it been fulfilled already? through the life of Christ? Some will already fulfilled, some will be fulfilled. That's as, as close as I can. Okay, that's the fastest answer we've had so far. Yes, you get, you get, yeah, I mean, he only had, he only answered in six seconds, but that's the, uh, we can respond. Uh, if you can do it in three seconds, that would be very amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, well, well, Christ is reported to have said in the Gospel of Matthew that uh, you know uh, the, uh, the, the stars are going to fall, and um, it's not coming to my mind right now. But I think basically, in, in a nutshell, I would agree with Alex. Some of the prophecies have been fulfilled, and some of them have not been fulfilled. Thank you. Okay, um, I think uh, that's that's not. I don't think that's relevant as far as topic. It's more afterwards. I can make it relevant. Okay, okay. Okay, we have a very interesting question here, a very uh, existential question. And it's uh, Sadat, are you going to paradise slash heaven? Why and how do you know? Uh, I can make this relevant to uh, the Torah and to Alex's presentation. He said that the Adam, the Abraham, the Noah, the Lot, the David that he sees in the Bible, he sees no connection between what Muslims do. He doesn't see a connection uh, between the Muslim versions of those prophets and the biblical uh, versions of those prophets. Well, here's one parallel or here's one resemblance right here. Abraham didn't jump up and down and say he's saved. David, Noah, Lot, they didn't jump up, up and down and say they're saved. Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, they didn't jump up and down and say that they're saved. So it's nothing of shame for me to, to not jump up and down and say that I'm saved. I say that I'm going to paradise, inshallah, by the will of God. Now, just today, uh, God put it in my heart, I guess, because during the Juma or the Friday prayer service, the Imam recited from Surah uh, uh, Ala, in which it says, the afterlife is, uh, the afterlife is better. وَآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى uh, so the, the Quran says that uh, the afterlife is better for you than this world. You should be aiming for the afterlife. And it says this, it says, it says this in the scriptures of Abraham and in the scriptures of Moses. So one question to throw back at you is where in the Torah does it talk about paradise or salvation or heaven? It doesn't talk about that at all. Okay. Uh, 
Um, thank you. Would you like to respond to that, Alex? Yes. Uh, I just want to add something to it. So, from my research on the Hadith, I find that some verses on the Hadith of Muhammad, peace be upon him, speaking, he basically affirmed that every Muslim on this planet will eventually go to paradise, according to several Hadith, but they, most of them will go through the hell, like detour in hell, temporarily, maybe for a million years, and then come back. But it's fine. Uh, well, in a, in the Bible, it's actually speak about either you go to hell or heaven. Uh, if you find yourself, God forbid, in hell, there is no come out, no way out. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Alex, um, uh, you did not provide an explanation of the clear textual differences between the different Torahs. What is your criteria for accepting the Masoretic text over others? Well, first of all, I mentioned and I said, I, I, I read some of the verses, of course, uh, from versions, different versions, like Septuagint and King James Bible and Masoretic text, and they all agree that Joseph, when Joseph was thrown uh, and sold to Egypt, his father was crying, he, and father said, well, Joseph is without doubt rendered in pieces, in different words, but the same narration. Narration had never been changed whatsoever. That's why I said, well, for me, it's irrelevant to say, well, maybe there is a words different, but they are all synonyms. They're all speaking about the same. But the Quran, in contrary, speaks completely different. It's 100% different. But all the Bibles on this planet, from that is called the earliest manuscript until today, the message is, oh, whatever the Bible will be written and revised 100 times, it will still, the narration of Joseph, and Jacob would still be absolutely the same. That's why I said they're virtually the same, they've never been changed. Thank you. Okay. Um, so that... <coughs> I think a larger problem than the contradiction between the Bible and the Quran is the contradiction between the Bible and the Bible. That's a bigger problem. The Torah contradicting the Torah is a bigger problem than the Torah contradicting the Quran. Again, is it Genesis 1 or is it Genesis 2? Is it the animals created first or is it the humans created first? In regards to the Joseph story, uh, I already pointed out a problem with that in the introduction that you have, a, you have a dream from God which is unfulfilled. The dream is Joseph sees the sun and the moon, i.e. both of his parents and the 11 stars, his 11 brothers submitting to him as the ruler of Egypt. That never happens. How do I trust the Torah when I can't trust a vision or a dream coming from God in the Torah? You have to be able to trust the God of the Torah. Uh, and also in that same, very same story, who sold Joseph into Egypt? Was it the Midianites or was it the Ishmaelites? Every Bible in the world contains this problem. Which version is the correct one? Because you have different strands of writers. One strand says that the Midianites sold Joseph into uh, Egypt. The other one says the Ishmaelites sold him. Thank you. Sadat, uh, you quoted some scholars that the Old Testament text was fluid. How do you account for the Isaiah? Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the same as we have today, is this not proof that the text has not changed? Uh, I don't know, uh, in all honesty, how many um, passages of Isaiah are there. I don't know if it's the complete uh, scroll or not. You would know better than me. So that's fine. We don't have to deny that, that uh, it has not been changed. Yeah, we don't have to deny that. Thank you. We don't have to deny that that hasn't been. See, again, understand, Muslims are not saying everything's been changed, everything's been lost, everything's been corrupted. That's a black and white dichotomy that's being imposed on the debate, which I don't subscribe to. Uh, and similarly, even if we were to prove that the Torah, even though it's impossible because there are different Torahs as I proved, uh, but even if we were to prove one particular version of the Torah has never been changed since the time of Jesus or before that, we're still left with the problem of the first 1,000 years. Uh, just very quickly, I mean, if the police come knocking on my door and they say, Sadat, somebody got murdered in front of your house, sometime in the past three hours he was killed and you're a suspect. And I say, well, there's no way I could have done it because I didn't even leave the house for the past, past hour and a half. Well, okay, I didn't leave the house for the past hour and a half. What was I doing before that? The question still remains. Okay, Alex? Yes, uh, I'd like to comment on that. And let's say if uh, scholars will find, I mean, archaeologists will find not 2,000 years old scholar, uh, Torah, but 3,000 years old scholar, what will you say in order to deny the Torah? And second of all, I want to say about... Uh, well, will you accept Isaiah 53 to be unchanged? Because I quote from directly from uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah chapter 53, and then I quote from uh, Acts, two words from Isaiah, and I just read entire Isaiah from King James Bible. 
So would you accept that this text was not changed? Would you accept that Christ was indeed crucified and you need to accept him in order to be, to be saved? Will you? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Alex, question for you. Uh, Genesis 37, verse 28 says, The Midianites, parenthesis Egyptians, sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites, parenthesis Arabs, who sold him in Egypt. Verse 36 says, Midianites took Joseph to Egypt and sold him there. Is this a contradiction, not an evidence of the documentary hypothesis? Well, as I understand, Midianites and Ishmaelites were the same people in a sense. Like, we don't know how much they interact and intermarried within them. But yet we have to go to the story of Gideon and find how the Gideon was years, hundred years after the story of Joseph of fighting in the northern part of Israel across the, uh, across the uh, Jordan River and he fought Midianites and what happened and he said like he took the rings of the camels I think, the golden rings and it said why they have it because they were Ishmaelites so it's the interchangeable uh, name that's why I understand. Thank you. Okay, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, if they were interchangeable names, then it doesn't make sense why the Midianites sold them to the Ishmaelites or vice versa. Why are they mentioned as two different groups? And then it specifically says in Genesis that uh, I believe it was the Midianites sold them to the Ishmaelites. Um, and the Ishmaelites took them down, but elsewhere then it says the Midianites took them down. So if they're the same group, why are they uh, talking and doing business transactions with one another? Question for Sadat. Uh, Sadat, what advice would you give to a Christian who doubts his or her faith? Spiritual advice. And why would someone become a Muslim? Please give spiritual advice related to faith, God, and prayer. Sure. I think this question is a good example of why, uh, and this partially answers uh, a couple of the points that Alex had brought up during this presentation. Why would the Quran direct anybody to the Torah and say, you know, you don't stand on anything unless you stand by the Torah? In other words, hold firm to it. Why would it do that? It would do it for the same reason that I would do that. I would uh, uh, point a Christian, for example, back to the Torah, back to the first commandment. That hero Israel, our Lord, is uh, one God. Our Elo, it says in Hebrew, our Elo is Echad. Our Lord is one. Our Allah is one. Hulhu Allahu Ahad. So uh, it's often due to expediency or for convenience that uh, Muslims will do that. It makes sense to me that the Quran would do that as well. Uh, I'm ready to quote from Paul. You know, you think that we're enemies of Paul. I'm ready to quote from Paul. If a Christian came up to me and said, What do you think about me marrying, uh, you know, my gay partner? And he claims to be a Christian? Well, I'm ready to even quote from Paul if it will bring him back to uh, the proper path or bring him closer to the truth. So my advice to the Christian uh, in a nutshell would be to reflect back on the Torah itself. What does the Torah prove? Does it prove that Abraham was worshipping the Son of God? Or was Noah worshipping the Son of God? Or was Lot worshipping the Son of God? Or were they just worshipping God like Muslims did? It's time. Thanks. Alex? Yes, um, I'd like to say uh, that um, According to Islam, no child, uh, for the uh, Muhammad peace be upon him, he said in the Hadith, no child is born but had Islamic faith, but parents will make him a Christian or Jew. According to Islam, we're all born pure. According to the Torah, Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve, we're all born sinners. Therefore, we require how can we save ourselves as only through the blood of Christ, and all blood sacrifice, if you want to say it. So my understanding is salvation. There is how you can you, Islam speaking about fund, against fundamental truths we have right now. Even our children, as the two years old, we call them terrible truths. They all are like we we know how to sing without even learning it. So the Torah is true, and I doubt if Islam, the tradition of Islam, the doctrine of Islam, are true. Okay, I think we are coming to our final uh, and, uh, question for the night. Uh, so, uh, Alex, uh, I'll ask you this question and then Sadat, you could uh, comment. Um, um, Alex, Isaiah 53, is it talking about the Messiah or the Jewish nation? Well, very good question. Thank you very much for asking because once I was talking to one Muslim guy in London, UK, and he said, well, I'm going to quote you, I'm going to read Isaiah 53 and explain you differently what you think. It's, it's 
it's Isaac is really about. And I talk to Jewish people, and they they exactly speaking about that's about nation of Israel compared to the Gentile nation, and that's fine because we have the Christians, we understand the words differently. And Paul, Peter, Eunuch, uh, they all Jew, they understood that words like us because that's why concept of Messiah, sovereign Messiah came, and Christ was accepted as Messiah by many Jews in the beginning. And then non-Jews became a Christian later on. But it's fine to have different opinions. What I try to tell during this whole presentation, then the text itself has not been corrupted. And Jews have never removed the text from it. And therefore, we have nothing, we cannot argue the text, or we can argue about how the text will interpret itself. And I think it's fine if you don't believe that Christ is a suffering Messiah, you believe it's a Jewish nation, or whatever you want. That's fine with me. But one day you will stand before God who gave a Torah and you will give an answer to him why you deny his word. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, even though the question is not relevant to uh, whether the Torah is trustworthy or not, but we can consider Isaiah part of the greater Torah of the Jews. Um, uh, the preceding uh, chapters and the subsequent chapters after Isaiah 53 both identify that suffering servant as Israel. So. Um, if I were to uh, approach it in the same way that Christians approach Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, they insist, you have to see Muhammad's name there. Where is his name spelled out? So by that criterion, we don't see Jesus anywhere in Isaiah 53. Uh, I don't think it's a foreshadowing of him. It doesn't mention that this is God himself in person and that it will be necessary for you to believe in him in order to gain salvation. Isaiah 53 uh, doesn't mention any of that. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I, my own here, we will hear um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I do declare the debate to be formally over. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity, however, to uh, thank both uh, Alex Grimley and Sadat Anwar for their wonderful work. And I, must, uh, I also want to say that uh, from the beginning, these two gentlemen have been cordial towards each other, and from the very beginning, they've been very um, understanding. Uh, they were the easiest people to deal with because they were mutually uh, very friendly with each other. They didn't dispute uh, issues, etc. And and this is, I think, a wonderful sign of what of what dialogue is all about. And um, and between Muslims and Christians and anyone else. Uh, and it's it's my hope that it doesn't end here tonight. The dialogue or the debate does not end here. Uh, take what you've heard tonight. God has given us a mind to use for His glory. And um, truth is a very heavy matter. It's not, it's not a trifling matter. It is of a, a eternal significance. Uh, and so I would ask that you go from this place uh, and go thinking about what you've heard uh, tonight and, and, and considering the ramifications of what Sadat said or what Alex said. And also recognize that, uh, that most, most importantly, uh, we are all part of the human family and, and that we, uh, we are all uh, sons and daughters of Adam. And, and that we are, in that sense, really brothers and sisters in Adam to each other. So let us go from this place in peace. And, uh, and uh, maybe sometime down the road, Alex and, and Sadat will be back uh, with another debate to, uh, to uh, help educate us. Thank you very much, gentlemen.